Alrighty. Why don't we kick off? Welcome to tonight's class on irrigation basics for the home gardener, taught by former CASFIS apprentice Avery Miller. Next slide, please. We're going to start with a little bit of Zoom housekeeping. I'm sure we've all been on a lot of Zoom calls at this point, but um, thanks for joining. We, um, we are going to mute you when you come on. Please remain muted, but feel free to send questions and comments through the question and answer function on the Zoom or in the chat. We will answer whatever we can during the session, and um, that probably won't be much because this is a very specialized topic. And Avery will answer questions at the end. So we'll keep track of what you asked and feed them to her at the end of the session. If you would like to see closed captioning of the audio on the bottom of the screen, because you want to read what, what's being said, you can click the button that's called CC Live Transcript. Um, and that will deploy the closed captioning. This session is being recorded and we will send a link to everyone who attended the class. Uh, after, a day or two after the workshop, along with some other references and videos. And if you need technical assistance during the call, please chat with Vanessa Ackerman, who is our Zoom hostess. She will help you out. Next. These free public workshops are sponsored by uh, CASFIS and the Friends of the UCSC Farm and Garden. We are a support group that um, raises money and awareness about CASFIS's excellent work with the food system. If you're not a Friends member yet, we encourage you to become one tonight. Besides supporting the farm, you'll get discounts uh, on uh, tools, seeds, plants at different garden centers in town. You get invitations to exclusive events and updates about all the fine work that CASFIS is doing. Plus you have the knowledge that you're contributing to the food system solution through education and research with your support. And we're gonna put a, a link to that membership um, form in the chat in case you'd like to join. Next, please. This is one of our many perks as a member. We're having our plant sale, which we haven't had in a couple of years. So it's pretty exciting. We're all pretty thrilled about having the plant sale again. It's gonna be on the 1st and the 2nd of May. And the first three hours on Saturday from 9 to 12 um, will be early entry for Friends members. So um, again, become a friend and we will add a link to the detail page about the plant sale that will show you how to uh, sign up for your early entry if you're a, a Friends member. And that's enough about that. Let's uh, move on to Avery and she's going to talk about the land we we reside on. Great, hello, uh, I'm Avery. And it's always wonderful to start any presentation or talk by recognizing that the land that we are on. Um, we're here, I'm out in the Santa Cruz mountains um, and sam similarly Santa Cruz is close by. So the core of the Center of Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems work is responsible, responsible, sustainable land stewardship. Today we honor and learn from the original land stewards of these lands, the Awaswa speaking Uipi tribe. They are represented today by their descendants, the Amamutsan tribal band. And we really encourage you to understand their history and support their work um, at the website as they continue to reclaim their sovereignty and protect the ecosystem for generations to come. They are doing a lot of really beautiful work at a lot of local farms in the area and, um, and at UCSC. So yeah, take a breath with that. Hi, okay. <laughs> so a little about me, I'm Avery. I use they, them pronouns. And um, I grew up pretty rural but very disconnected from my food. It wasn't a big part of life when I was a child. I had a lot of packaged food, a lot of processed food, and a lot of fast food. But I've always loved nature. I love the trees, um, dandelions, 
And there was a seasonality of summer where there's fresh corn on the cobs and strawberries. And I, I really learned how to appreciate and love those fresh foods. Uh, through college, I um, graduated and began to work in restaurants. And that love of food grew and grew even more. And I began to volunteer on the farmer's markets while living in Brooklyn and exploring these ideas of seasonality and um, what was available while also working at this restaurant that had these demands to have the same products all the time. And I felt this deep divide and this longing to understand a little more about um, the food system and where food were, were was coming from which brought me to Arizona to an eight acre farm. And there I learned kind of all of the, the basics of farming and just fell in love and began a new, a new life path. Um, after that season, I continued to do different internships with gardening and uh, began to study herbalism and health through plants. And all of this kind of coalesced in me coming to Cascus to learn how to really grow more of my medicines and take my love of farming and herbalism. And at Caspis, I stayed. And um, when you stay as a second year, you get to choose a, a path and I chose irrigation. And it was something I knew nothing about beforehand, um, except for that water, plants need water. And through being there and through learning and embodying it myself and teaching it with my uh, various first years and the years after, I just grew to love it and now want to share some of that knowledge with you. Um, now I'm working at a little two and a half acre homestead and we're in the early stages of starting a perennial permaculture plant nursery. Um, we kind of call it the Sand Hill Springs Perennial Permaculture Nursery. So that's a little about me. Um, I'd love to know what brought you here and we have a little poll so I can get a better idea of what to sort of talk about more. Oh, this is so fun watching everybody respond. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's just give it a couple more seconds. Hopefully, looks like people are still responding. All right, if you haven't responded, just uh, Finish that up real quick. And yeah. All right, great. So it seems like most people have a mix of beds and fruit trees. Um, and most people want to understand a little more about soil moisture and when to water and really split on if you already have an irrigation system installed. Awesome. So we're going to be talking about all of these things, but that is just a nice way to let me know where to ramble more and where not to. Great. So what we are going to talk about today is what is irrigation and why is it needed for our plants? This concept of being a water-wise irrigator, um, how to evaluate soil moisture by feel. Oops. I don't know if the, the pole keeps popping up for me, but um, how to evaluate soil moisture by feel. Uh, understand different variables in plants' water needs. We're gonna talk a lot about drip systems and how to design drip systems, or at least um, a few ex examples of that. So why irrigation? What is irrigation? Why do we need to talk about this? Irrigation is essentially this human intervention of moving water to areas for growing plants when rainwater is not sufficient. Um, plants need water 
They're, it's essential for the building blocks to create their physical structure for nutrient exchange and to maintain temperature within the plants. And irrigation has been around for over 8,000 years and is one of the catalysts of how we started civilization as we know it. And we're living in these areas uh, where we are in California is a great example where the there's just such a long dry season, we couldn't grow a lot of these crops that we love and would hope for without irrigation. But we want to be water wise irrigators. Um, and so we're adding water to the soil because there's two main ways that water is being lost in this in the system. We have transpiration, which is water that is leaving through the plant leaves and evaporation, water loss from the soil surface. And we, in irrigation, we call this uh, evapotranspiration. And this is a, a number and a, a, a thing that we're gonna come back to often. And it's affected by temperature, humidity, wind, rain, all of these external factors. And you can even think of yourself as the plant um, when these things are increased, when it's really hot outside, when it's really humid, you're gonna sweat, you're gonna feel that more. Similarly, a plant is gonna give out more water um, to the trans evapotranspiration. So in our irrigation, nowadays we're thinking of how to be a water um, conservation. We want to grow the hardiest plants with using the least amount of water possible. There's a lot of demand on our water systems these days. And um, the main way that we're gonna do water conservation is through the wet dry swing. And this is essentially a technique to, to create optimal um, and conditions for your plants to grow. And we're gonna do that wet dry swing through checking soil moisture. And we're gonna go over that a little more. But why do we not wanna over irrigate? Um, I've got my little cheat sheet. So plants, if they're over watered, are gonna over or under watered are naturally gonna have a lot more pests and disease issues. If you're noticing that it's often a sign of water stress or overwatering. Um, overwatered soils are gonna become more compact. They're gonna be harder for those roots to, to grow through. Um, and the plants will have more opportunity to start rotting out. Overwatering also leaches nutrients through the soil. So you can imagine you put a little bit of fertilizer on there, but if you're overwatering, it's gonna keep pooling down through the system and no longer be available to the plant. Underwatering on the other hand is also gonna stress the plant out, create more pest and disease issue, but eventually could lead the plant to death. Um, and we'll keep coming back to different methods of water conservation throughout this as we, as we move on. So what we're doing to be a water wise irrigator and work on a, this idea of wet dry swing and watering when it's appropriate and um, without overwatering or underwatering is doing soil moisture by feel. It's a qualitative method for evaluating soil moisture and it's best used on our mixed crop garden systems because that way we can address crop diversity, different stages of crop development, environmental factors, and really utilizing our visual assessment of the plants. And um, to talk about this a little further, um, I, made, I made a couple videos so that we can continue to have this conversation while understanding a little bit more about the language around it. And so this is just some of the language that we're gonna be using throughout the rest of this. <laughs> I work outside. I don't really know Zoom. Um, You're good now. Okay, let's try this. Just give me a thumbs up if it's working. We're gonna utilize our sponge here to represent the soil to get these terminology down. 
The sponge is a great example because it has air pockets and structure. It's raining or we're irrigating. All of the pore spaces in the soil are completely full. This is saturation. As that rain stops, there is a trickle of water coming through the soil profile. This is our gravitational water. This is water being pulled down via gravity. Once that's finished, we're less left with 100% field capacity. So saturation minus gravitational water, field capacity. As time happens, transpiration, evaporation, or transevaporation, we're gonna be losing water in our system. And all of this water that's coming out easily is gonna be our plant available water. You can imagine my hand is kind of like the root system soaking up and then losing the water through its leaves and through the soil surface. What we're left with is a soil profile that does have water in it, but it's being held onto by the soil or the sponge. This is unavailable water. And at this point, we get to a field capacity that is decreased to a point we call a permanent wilting point, where the water is unavailable to the plant, thus it will wilt and eventually die. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Excellent recovery. Okay, great. I'm learning new skills all the time. Um, so hopefully that was helpful to have a little bit of a visual. Um, the sponge is a really great tool to kind of see what's happening on in, in the soil because we can't really see down it. But again, our soil saturation is when that sponge is full or that soil is full of water, gravitational water, it's being pulled down. Field capacity is the water that the soil is capable of holding onto after that gravitational water is gone. Permanent wilting point is the point where the sponge like this one here is so dry or the soil is holding onto so much of the water that it's no longer available to the plant. And then that available water is that time in between that those two. Um, but not all soil has this perfect combination of, um, it's not all the same, all soil is differently, different. Because there's three different particle sizes in our soil. We have the sand, which is gonna be our heaviest, silt kind of in the middle and clay, which is the smallest particle. And the first thing you have to know about our soil is our soil texture type. You can do this with a simple um, jar test. So I just took some soil from the garden and put it in this jar and then just shake, 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 shake. It can be any jar, any clear jar. And just shake, 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 shake. And then just let it sit for a couple days. And what you'll get is, and it's not, that easy to tell, but you'll you'll see some lines. And I try to take some pictures and then just measure those. The longer it can sit, often the better it's gonna be. And the reason this is important because water is gonna move very differently in our different types of soil, then it's just gonna move differently. So once you've done your jar test, um, we're going to use this really fun graph to determine what your soil type is. So for the example of this, is this jar here, um, we call this Sandhill Springs, this is where I live. You take your total mass, which is going to be 3.3 inches, and figure out each part, how much of that is each part, and then just do a simple division. I cheated a little bit. It's gonna give you a 0.75, which 
it just can turn into a percentage. Um, and so to read this chart, I like to start with whatever I have that's the largest thing. So my largest thing is going to be sand. So I'm going to come to my 75% sand. And then I'm looking at my silt, which is my second largest thing. Here's about 18% silt. This is the silt side. And then just following that line down until I hit my 75% sand. Um, your math should equal 100, so automatically that will bump me in my 7% clay. And so looking at this, I can see that I have a loamy sand. Definitely a very sandy soil. Um, for our second example site, we have slightly different ones. We're going to go to our 50% sand and our 40% silt and follow that line down. This is a nice number right on the line um, till I bump into that 50% sand and 10% clay and have more of a medium loam. So do this um, before to really, uh, bef bef as first thing, I would like go out and do it right afterwards and start from there. Um, and the reason this is important because the, as I said, the way water moves through the system is going to be highly affected by your, your soil type. You can see in this little image here of the, the water moving through the soil profile that because a clay soil has such small particle sizes, the, the water is going to have, is going to be holding on, right? There's more surface area there for the water to hold on to, and it's going to grab onto that more which will, through capillary action, which will move the water in a little more of an expansive direction versus a gravitational water direction. So we want a soil, ideally, that is a little more in the loam with a good combination of clay, silt, and sand so that we create a nicer kind of um, capillary action that's creating something that's more available to the, all the plants and you can see the sand kind of drains down pretty quickly and has a lot of gravitational water that's going to be inaccessible. And on the opposite side, more clay soils aren't going to have that gravitational water and going to be harder for those deeper roots to get saturated. So wanting this zone here where we have more water available to the plants. Don't have to overthink it, it's just a general thing. So while we're doing our soil moisture by feel, learning this new skill, and it's it might seem a little complicated as I just sit here and, and spew about it, but when you start going out to your garden site and getting your hands in, it's gonna be a lot easier because it's a very, um, qual it's like very much about touching the soil. And so I can show you as many pictures and as many examples, but really go out, really, really do this. But to, to best do this, it's good to know where we're beginning. And it's easiest to start at 100% field capacity at that level of we know that we just irrigated and we've let that gravitational water go through and that we're at that high field capacity. And this is, to, because it is an estimating system, it's gonna be just easier to start there. And when we're checking soil moistures, we always wanna check it at the, the root depth of the plant. And we wanna make sure that our whole soil profile is watered all the way through at this initial watering when we're going out and doing a good test. Um, so how are we checking soil moisture by feel? There's a few things that we're mostly looking at and then referring to this page here that's gonna start helping us create these connections until we've done this enough that we start to have just an automatic understanding. Color is a big one. Soil naturally lightens mm -hmm. as it dries um, down. 
And then moisture, we can see moisture that will leave residue on our hand, or if it's super dry, it will leave our hands really, really dry. So we can have that physical analysis. And then this idea of forming a ball or a cast. And this is kind of like in the picture here, there's this idea of just right, like oversaturated and undersaturated and just right with that. So I have another little video of doing a few soil moisture checks. Let's watch that. Oh, I think this is the right video. Um, you can see it. That's great. So our first zone where we're going to do some soil moisture checking by feel, um, it really helps to have a lovely companion, like little olives here. Um, also, this is a soil probe. This is a pretty small soil probe. I like to stick my soil probe right between the plants, where I imagine if my irrigation was running, where the water would actually be going with the plants pop that up. It's this consistent color all the way through. And that's going to tell me that I have moisture going all the way through. You'll see over the next couple of days as we do this, the color is going to lighten as the top dries down. So we can grab this. Again, seeing that dark rich color, feeling this moisture sticking in my hands, because this is kind of a sandy soil, it doesn't work so well to do the clump test, but it is holding fairly well for such a sandy soil. This is a different zone of my garden space. This was unimproved soil. This is our native soil here. And it's got a lot more sand in it. So I thought it would be fun to see what the sand looks like right after it rains. I'm gonna use my hori hori this time just to give you another feel. So I really do want to try to get down there a good six inches. But and similarly, we've got that nice dark color. That's our first thing we're looking for. Checking our ball, our casting ball, and it's actually holding together super well. And then the residue on my hand, I've definitely got some residue. Great, so you'll hear me say these same things over and over and over, right? Um, color, residue, um, ball, these are, these are primary things that we're looking at. Um, so these, both of these sites are loamy sands. One is definitely almost pure sand. Um, but we're taking this and comparing it and I'm going to have this, this uh, chart sent out to you so that you can bring it with you. I used to laminate this and give to all of my apprentices and carry it around as we checked every single bed every day um, to just start feeling that, feeling every day that, that seeing that color, seeing how it dries down and watching that. Um, and as it decreases, so in the video, those were probably in the 95 to 100 um, field capacity. And as, it, as we watch the soil dry down and decrease, you can see in this probe that I did here, it's going to start being lighter up top because the moisture is evaporating and um, out of it. It's, it's pretty much only evaporating because there's no plants here. Um, and, as, and when I tried to get it out of the probe, it, it no longer could hold that ball. It was so crumbly that it wouldn't even come out of the probe in a whole form. So comparing that, recognizing that that means that field capacity is decreasing. The deeper down I went in my probe, I could still form a pretty weak ball and still felt some coldness and some residue on my hands. So knowing how the the moisture there was differently. And this kind of goes back to really checking the soil moisture where your plants are. So if this was a younger plant, I would probably water it because I wasn't 
able to get a good ball and I felt like it had a more of a 40 um, to 50 percent field capacity but if I had an older plant with deeper roots that could have waited a little longer before being watered because there was still moisture at that level in the plants. Then we can kind of look more at a medium loam. This was the other little um, jar that I had on the, the thing. And seeing how that is going to have slightly different actions and activities for our, our, the way it creates a ball and this idea of ribboning. Ribboning only really works with more clay soils and really excitingly, I didn't make a slide for this, but today I actually found some clay in my sand pit. Um, and you can actually see how the clay just feels a lot finer than the sand. And this, this is very wet. And let's see if I can make it so you can actually see this without getting it all over my computer. But it's going to be a lot darker. And um, I, I, I tried to ribbon it, but it just makes too much of a mess. But essentially, you would take the more clay soils and try to create a ribbon by squeezing it through your fingers. This is another method as well for checking your soil type if you don't have time to do a jar test because sandy soils will not ribbon and medium soils will kind of create a, a very loose ribbon. The more ribboning that you're getting, that means the more clay you're going to have in your soil. So you can think about that before you do your watering. But um, I have very little clay in my soils here. And then this medium one can watch it. Uh, this, this image is kind of in the like 80% field capacity. And these are just things over time as you are looking at your soil moisture day in and day out, watching it dry down um, or watching it get moistened by your irrigation and your rain that you just are going to start learning. There's, um, it's a lot of fun to have a friend over and compare what you think. And if you do want to get very technical with this, there are also moisture readers to, to put into your soil. I've never successfully used one. I, I really find that I like to utilize my own observation and my own um, understanding of my soils to really figure that out. Yeah, so hopefully that was helpful. Um, I'm gonna go kind of step back from soil moisture for a second and just talk about irrigation needs of crops by different development stages. And this is a basic rule of thumb that younger, smaller crops are gonna need more water more frequently and older, more mature crops are gonna need more water less frequently. This is essentially due to that idea of like moisture or of, of the water evaporating and trans evaporating from the top of the soil versus the depths are gonna hold on to that a little more. So you can imagine if we have small roots, um, like my little, Here's my little uh, seedling that just, you know, it's still got its little seed here and it's just popping out. And so it has a very shallow root system. So that's going to need water more often because this top inch is going to dry down more often. Um, and it won't need to be watered as deeply because we, we want to conserve water and just water the roots of that little thing. But as our plants grow bigger, they're going to have deeper roots and we're going to want to get the water down to those roots. Um, and they won't need that as frequently because they're going to be able to hold on to that for longer. Many plants then, this is for annuals, so we have um, go through this 
kind of frequency and timing. And then many things after they have their fruiting phase are gonna have a dry down phase. This is true of um, grains, winter squashes, storage onions, where we're gonna cut water at, at that point to help with them being more hardy for, for drying and things like that. That can be, um, you can look a lot of that up. And then some other things to think about for different different things. Um, with annuals, there's also a lot of very drought tolerant or dry farmed uh, different crops. These are really awesome if we have limited water supplies or kind of um, different, just want to try something different. So here in California, dry farm tomatoes are a big thing but also there's a lot of corns and dry beans and even squashes um, that have been adapted to be grown on these very low to no water. And they essentially are doing that by having a super deep taproot that gets very deep into the ground. With annuals, there are certain critical life stages where we don't want to create water stress. Um, a good example of this is with broccolis when they're going into their head formation. They, um, we, we almost want to create a system where they're not getting as much dry down so that they always have moisture to go through this like big life stage where they're trying to flower essentially because the broccoli is the flower. And then understanding if we have water loving crops, which aren't going to want to go down as far in their field capacity. Great example of this is um, the beautiful, beautiful dahlias um, and other uh, celery things. And then on the so, oh, and then my image here is um, some quinoa. Quinoa actually is likes a little less water. If overwatered, it can start lodging or falling over. And then one of our conservation techniques for holding water into our soil is going to be mulching. So we can use, this is a straw mulch that I put on the baby plants um, with orchards. We can do cardboard mulching and wood chip mulching. And these are all great things because they not only hold water into the, in the soil, but they will break down naturally and help create better soil structure over time if you use it year after year. Perennials are gonna have a slightly different arc of water needs than an annual because the annual is basically going from seed, it's growing, it's fruiting, it's flowering, it's fruiting, it's, it's dying, going back to the seed. Perennials, some will go through a dormancy phase, which can be almost like that seed phase, um, and some are just going to be green all the time. So when you're putting in perennials, it's always good to kind of look at what its irrigation needs are, understanding if it's a native, maybe it will naturally want those dry periods that come with your local climate. Um, and tree orchards are on the other hand gonna need large quantities of water less often because those roots similar to a mature annual are gonna be very deep, even deeper probably than the annuals and gonna really need deep, deep waterings, but continue to have that wet, dry swing. Um, cane fruits are fun because they will grow towards the water when they can. Um, so uh, they're another one where you really need to look at when you're buying a plant, making sure it's gonna be appropriate to your zone, to the amount of water you have and if it's gonna, and, and what its needs are, and where can you put it on your land that is gonna be best for it. So if you have a, a zone that's drier, maybe put your more drought tolerant plants there. And if you have a zone that's wetter, put your naturally more water loving plants there and kind of let nature also help you conserve water that way. Medicinal herbs, I just wrote this on here because I love growing medicinal herbs and they, many of them, not all, have this really awesome thing where to stress them actually creates a more potent medicine. 
And so stress in annuals can be really bad, but in perennials it can often be good. And so just understanding your plants, getting to know your plants. Great. Um, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about drip irrigation in this last uh, little bit. I'm pretty much only gonna talk about drip irrigation because of timing. If you have questions about overhead or sprinklers, please feel free to reach out. Um, but a lot of the a lot of the thoughts are going to be exactly the same with that. So when you're putting in a new system, there's a lot of questions to ask yourself. Um, what, what are my irrigation goals? Why do I want to add drip irrigation? What do I have available? how large an area needs irrigation, and how automatic or manual do I want the system? This is a good, I really like this last question because maybe you love hand watering every day, but wanna be more water wise and um, deal with getting water right to the plants. That's why we use drip irrigation, but still wanna be out there and part of the system. So you can create a system where you have to turn it on and off just like if you were watering with a hose, right? Um, our example is gonna be an, an elementary school garden that we installed some drip on. And our uh, goals, we had 14 four by 10 boxes that we wanted to, to get irrigation on all of them to reduce kind of inconsistencies of the students watering them and to reduce the need for summer parent volunteers and as well to reduce any potential for leakages of like students leaving things on um, and different things of that sort. Um, okay, so some more questions to ask yourself. There's a lot of questions. Where is your water gonna come from? In the school garden, we had hose bibs at the top of each bed, but maybe you have an underground plumbing system that's already set up or well tank, gray water, rainwater systems, just understanding what the your soil is like. And then the quality of your water, do you have um, a different pH? Do you have a lot of sedimentation or mineralization? things that we're just gonna need to know. Um, at the school garden, it's on city water. We're always gonna begin with a header, right? Like just like a document, we have the header, it's the beginning. And for a system, most systems are already gonna have a header built in, but a timer can also act as a header. So in the school garden, we put a timer on the underground piping that would just turn it off at night and, um, so that nothing could be watered or if somebody came into the garden, they couldn't um, run water and waste water or do anything like that. The next thing you need is a filter. Regardless of if you're on city water or um, not city water, having a filter is going to be really important to just keep that that drip tubing running longer and getting more life out of it and not letting any clogs get in there. So there's two types of filters. We have screen filters, which are just keeping debris from flowing in. This is a pretty common screen filter. It's a, just an inline screen filter. You can put it right on your hose. I'll show you a photo of that. And I find these are really great to work with. If you have a small, a small system, we even use these up at the Caspis farm and um, they're easy to clean. If you have city water, you probably are gonna only clean this once a year. I live at a place where we get most of our water from a spring box. And so we have these on every zone, but also these more high capacity filters. So if you are getting your water from uh, a place with more sedimentation, you might need more filtration. And um, here's the disc filter It's just another, method for getting different particle sizes um, out of your water. The last component you need in your header is a pressure regulator. This is basically just going to 
re regulate the flow of water in your system and create more consistency through your drip line and also prevent it from um, getting overwhelmed within the system. And so you can see here the water starts flowing and then it, it kind of locks that and keeps the, a more consistent flow through there. So this is um, a really simple hose bib setup. We have our on off valve, some just some adapter parts. The filter always goes first and then the, our timer. You can get so many different types of timers. Um, I would honestly just when you're buying uh, irrigation, hopefully in person, talk to the various people or if you want to get really fancy and use um, some app based timers you can also send me a message about some of those so we have our timer which also functions as an on off valve and then the pressure regulator if you install this and none of it's working just make sure you're checking the direction of flow they do have to be put in a certain direction and as well, always listen, turn on your system, listen to it and make sure it's not leaking. Um, and I do have a video that I'll, I'll add to the other thing, but I basically said everything in it. Okay. So getting water from the header to the plants. You're gonna go to the irrigation store and you're gonna wanna sound like you, you know what you're talking about, right? Uh, don't be intimidated, most of them are really awesome, but I wanna give you the lingo. The first thing we always talk about is the diameter, the sizing of the tube. And these are all um, the different sizes, one inch, three quarter, half inch, and one quarter inch. Tubing does come in the millimeter sizes, but in the US, I pretty much stick with the inches. Um, these are gonna all be mainline tubing, which is tubing that has no drip emitters and it's gonna get us from our water source, like our hose bib to the actual plant. Then we're talking about shape and fittings. So a lot of the shapes are pretty straightforward, um, but the fitting is gonna be kind of a little bit how we talk about it. So compression fitting is gonna be something that tightens over the tubing. And this can be the drip line tubing or the main line tubing, um, but you'll see like this one here. And a threaded fitting is gonna be more of that screwing kind of thing. Um, couplers connect two things together. Elbows create that elbow. Um, T's create a T and the goof plug is gonna end quarter inch tubing, but also fill in holes that you may have put in something um, there. And then these are just two examples of hole punches. And I have some other parts here that are gonna be some of those fittings to get from hose to our poly um, lines. And I didn't write this down, but it's important that when we're connecting to something to a hose bib, that it is hose threaded. Hoses are gonna have different threading than um, some other irrigation parts that you might find. So just making sure you're getting something that's hose threaded or else it will probably leak. Getting into three quarter inch parts, you'll see you have a combination of the threaded and the compression. Um, the biggest difference I forgot to mention between these is that compression parts are financially, they're gonna be a lot cheaper than threaded parts, but they are basically impossible to reuse. Threaded parts are gonna um, screw on and off much easier and be a lot more reusable. So it kind of comes down to thinking about how long term do you want this design in place um, and what your financial needs are. This is where I'll give you my little belief that I only personally work with these thicker, what I call perennial plastic systems. A lot of farmers use drip tape 
and it only lasts one season and it mostly ends up in the trash. Although these thicker systems may have a higher initial cost, they're gonna last us a long time. And for the amount of um, garbage and just energy and um, even water that goes into producing plastics, we wanna work with something for a long, long time. And so I think it's really important to put in systems that are gonna have long lifespans that are gonna be easier to maintain and aren't just gonna end up in the trash and keep moving on that way. Um, last thing about this is that once you get up to like three quarter, you can start stepping down. So um, you might have a, a large zone that you wanna have a lot of water running through a three quarter inch and then moving it to a smaller zone, like a half an inch. And then from there you can even go to that quarter inch. So it's, it's a lot of parts. The last um, little thing about when you're actually getting your drip line. So drip line is gonna come mostly in half inch and quarter inch, and it's gonna have different spacing between emitters. And so this is just simply here, I have some little corn plants with some quarter inch and with six inch um, spacer emitting emitters. And below, I have some dahlias that you can't see because they haven't come out of the ground yet um, with 12 inch spacing. When you're choosing what you'd like, it's a combination of your soil type. So remembering that our sand is gonna go down a lot. Um, more gravitational water is being pulled down. So we tend to want closer emitters and uh, if we have sandier soil, but as well as um, the, the amount of water you have flowing through your system. Quarter inch is only gonna run consistently on a smaller run line than our half inch tubing, which we can run a lot longer over larger areas. Um, and then individual drip emitters are gonna be great if you have a plant here and a plant there and just wanna get water right to those plants and they can just be popped right into that mainline tubing and be very adjustable. So I have um, put this photo back up. Um, the last, so when you actually are going to the store to, to get some irrigation, we're gonna wanna be understanding what we call flow rate, which is often in gallons per hour or could be liters per hour. Some things will only have one flow rate, like our quarter inch tubing, but some like this half inch tubing, you'll see there's two options. This is gonna mostly be decided based on your soil type. So if you have a more clay soil, you're gonna want a lower flow rate because it's gonna take longer for that water to pull in to the soil profile and you don't wanna create pooling or flooding. The sand on the other hand, because it's gonna percolate down faster, you can have a higher flow rate and to push that water in and try to get it to move to all the plants. And depending on these, um, you're gonna to need to know this to better understand uh, how, how long you're gonna water. Um, the other thing is that knowing what kind of tubing you're gonna use, it will tell you what kind of pressure regulator you're gonna need. Um, generally smaller tubing needs um, less pressure than a larger system. And they'll give you things like your, the maximum length of a line. There might be things on these labels um, such as its temperature, operating capacity and various things and even filtration requirements. So before you can actually build your header, you also have need an idea of what you're gonna be putting down so you get the right things. And the side note, always imagine that this is gonna be running at about probably closer to 90% efficiency for these systems. Um, and that will just be a good thing to factor in. So with our school garden, we um, 
had a little hose, we had our hose bib, we put our um, low flow pressure regulator right on there, had our mainline tubing, which was a half inch, going into these little quarter inch things because we had plants so close to each other that we wanted to have six inch spacing. And then over time and observation, originally we had four lines on each bed, but we're recognizing that strawberries needed a little more water. So we popped in two more. And that's why you need to keep coming back to soil moisture checking because um, it's going to give you a much better feel for what's happening on there. Um, after you install your system, come back to this, then you're going to start, you're going to water it deeply and then start checking your soil moistures to figure out um, when to water again. So the, yeah. <laughs> so, and a few things to, to come back to when you're checking that those soil moistures after you have your system is to keep watering to the root depth of the plants and adjust your frequency as your plants are growing or as you plant new plants. And always check your moisture before and after irrigation. This is gonna continuously, it's a, it's a lot of like do and do again um, with that. So you can see when you do these watering sets, is it watering deep enough? You can get soil probes that are much longer than that one. Um, is it water? Is it is it getting down through the soil profile? Is it feeling too wet, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and you might say, but how long do I water for? I created a little worksheet that ask um, that goes through based on what system that maybe you already have or you're thinking of putting in that you take these parameters that we were looking at, like gallons per hour, et cetera, et cetera, um, how close you have them, how much of a space. And so you'll go through the worksheet and that will give you a little bit of a rough idea of what that initial watering is gonna be, as well as a few extra tools and tricks on how to figure out how much to water um, after that while creating your more like garden schedule because it is nice to have a bit of a schedule to have to be predicting out into the future. Um, you wanna know if you're gonna have a heat wave coming up so that you can water beforehand or even just a hot day. We wanna water in the morning before the heat of the day so we're not losing a lot of that um, and different things like that. So where to find your drip um, system? Here in Santa Cruz, we have Ewing Irrigation. I like to go to my store in person. Ewing is great because they're actually an irrigation store and you can buy things um, by the piece and they're going to help you dry fit your system together. There are other home and garden stores. They tend to sell things in little packages, which is a lot of extra plastic. And I tend to avoid that. Um, and they're much more expensive. And then online, there seem to be a bazillion of these. I've never used any of them, but there's um, Dripworks and Drip Depot. And I think that's mostly, yeah. I think Elise is going to talk about events. Yeah, before we dive into the Q&A, um, I just wanted to point out that we have some other great classes coming up, and we hope you can all make them. Um, so all these classes are free and virtual this year, and we've already talked about the plant sale. If you're in the area, don't miss it. Um, this winter squash grow along, we're going to do the second of a five part series. And this is a little bit of an experiment for us. It's a guided community discussion with a group of gardeners who come online um, every one to two months. And um, we'll all grow some kind of winter squash and share our experience. And this will be um, facilitated by Oren Martin from the Caspis Farm. Um, and at the end of the series, with COVID permitting, we will have a feast. We will bring our, our produce to share and to show. Um, if we are run out of things to talk about uh, regarding winter squash and we have Oren on the line, we will be able to basically have office hours with him 
um, on any topic you bring. So that's fun. Our, our first one has already happened, but you can find it on the CASFIS YouTube channel. And if you have any questions about that, just um, shoot us an email. In May, our annual Strawberry and Justice Festival, which unfortunately will not be in person because there's a wonderful strawberry shortcake involved. Um, they are gonna offer a series of sessions focusing on social justice and environmental topics related to the strawberry production uh, um, system. And then we're gonna have our annual poetry festival, which we usually have in the Chadwick Garden um, but that's going to be virtual as well. And we're going to start with a video that's going to walk us through the garden in June. It should be beautiful. And then there will be four published famous confirmed poets, which we um, will have that information out to you and on the website at casfus.ucsc.edu. Uh, and that will be coming out um, very soon. And then June 16th, Oren Martin again is going to teach one, one of his most popular classes, Always Draws a Crowd, and it's about caring for citrus. Um, usually that attracts about 50 or 60 people who are all crowded around the instructor trying to see what's happening with the pruners in his hand. And this year, you're all going to have front row seats to a live lecture that's free instead of many dollars um, through Zoom and the magic of video. And with that, let's... Um, Move to the next slide and then we'll feed you some questions. Yeah, and this is um, this is great, the squash go along because uh, as well as water and I, um, I'm obsessed with kabocha squash. So I really hope we get to do this in person because <laughs> I could make such good kabocha squash things. I also realized I, I um, lose my notes and I didn't talk specifically about some of my water conservation um, things. So really quickly, um, mulching, straw mulching, wood chip, cardboard mulching is also a really great thing if you're doing trees. Um, and then watering at times of day when you have less light. So in the mornings and in the evenings, as long as it's not going to freeze overnight. Um, I find I like to water in the morning. It's a really great way to just wake up and um, connect with my plants, do a little moisture checking, be like, hey, how are you all doing? Um, I, I talk to my plants a lot. And being aware of the weather predictions, right? If there's going to be a heat wave, um, if there's going to be a lot of fog or rain the next day, we we want to let nature do most of the watering. But when we're in a, in a climate that nature doesn't do that for us, um, well, we have that. And as well as um, working on creating more resilient soils. So things like cover cropping, um, are gonna are gonna create soils with just better organic materials and organic material is gonna create a better um, holding capacity for that soil. And there's a, probably a lot of ways to go research that, but cover cropping is one of my favorites because you can just um, chop it down and leave it there and it almost can act like a natural mulch as well. So, yeah. Okay. Would you like some questions? Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, you were just talking about mulching and cover cropping. Um, so we did have a question about mulching, especially with cardboard, and if that's good for the soil, and um, what do you put on top of it? Yeah, I actually was cardboard mulching today. It's another thing that I'm, uh, I'm obsessed with. Um, the I mean, it's it's kind of aesthetic, right? You can definitely just cardboard mulch and um, just make sure, the reason we like cardboard is because water will go through it. Um, and we don't wanna put our irrigation under the cardboard because then we can't check it. So make sure that the you're putting the cardboard under the irrigation and then I mulch on top. Um, with wood chips. Wood chips are great because they are essentially a free resource that you can do things like go on to um, chip drop, 
um, dot com, and I think you can like sign up to get free wood chips. That site specifically, I have used. It did take me a really long time when I lived in Santa Cruz. Um, now that I live out in the Santa Cruz mountains, we have a lot more tree crews coming into our area and have um, built a relationship with them. And they know if they have good wood chips that they can drop them here. Because a lot of these companies want places to discard of their wood chips. Um, so they're a really great free resource. Uh, you, but yeah, you could just do the cardboard and it would be fine just making sure that you're watering enough that it is going to get through that cardboard and into the soil underneath. Did that answer the question? Uh, that more than answered the question. <laughs> okay. I, I didn't ask the question, so I don't know, but um, we just got another one related to that about redwood branches and, and pine needles. Are those good? Yeah, I would, things that I would avoid, um, redwood, I wouldn't put on top of other crops. Um, if you do get redwood, use it for paths. It's a really great, it's a really, really great to put on paths. Um, eucalyptus as well, try to avoid because that both, both of those just have those, um, natural things that kind of keep other things from wanting to grow with them in the forest and we don't want to be putting that on top of our plants so if you are there when somebody is delivering chips to you and they are trying to give you something you don't want use your voice and say no use your voice and say no yeah okay um we've had a couple questions about um irrigation for trees how do you gauge the water <clears throat> water needs of a tree? And how do you know the root depth of perennials and trees? And yeah. one tree in particular that was asked about was a birch. Oh. Or a loving tree. That's a good question. I don't know much about non-fruit trees, I will say. Um, and I yeah, I don't know anything about birches specifically. Um, with, with fruit trees, if it's an established fruit tree, we're gonna really um, water, get a, get a long soil probe that can check at least two or three feet down because the depth that we're checking at is tends to be the 24 to 36 inch range. And that's where we wanna be seeing how our wet dry swing is going. Um, and so we are gonna be putting down those larger quantities. We can, you can still use um, these drip systems and create rings. I didn't mention this, but it's a, it's a great way to put, you want water on a, on a tree all the way around it. Unlike maybe little shrubs, you could put two little emitters and they'd be fine. But on a tree, we want it all the way around. So you can create a ring system. Or you can see in this picture here, I have um, some overhead sprinklers. And a lot of the math for the overhead sprinklers is gonna be the same, but that it's shooting water in a star pattern around that. Um, and then was there a question about how often to water? Um, it was really how, how do you know how deep the root is and how much you should water to get to that level? Yeah, I think it really depends. Once it's mature, you could probably a good rule of thumb is imagine that it's in the two to three feet range. Um, but also looking up specifically, different trees are going to probably have different root systems. So just doing a quick Google search and like, what is the average root depth of this? this tree, um, fruit trees are gonna be probably a lot different than a, than a tree that's growing pretty natively because those are gonna have much deeper tap roots, I imagine. Okay. Um, someone has drip and they, they planted their new transplants that they did not survive, didn't seem to be getting enough water. Um, did she do something wrong? Oh man, I'd have to, to ask so many questions first. Um, this is this is actually a good question because I didn't really address this, but often when I am direct seeding or transplanting, I will just overhead water things for the first couple days 
because sometimes even if your drip system is working well, it um, it's going so slow. And if you're not running it long enough, it's not necessarily gonna, gonna saturate enough of that um, root zone or soil. So with a, with a pretty young plant or a seed, getting that hose on there and kind of over watering it just, just a bit is gonna really help and ensure that that plant is gonna live a little longer. Um, but also turning on the drip and watching it. I think um, I go through my whole property constantly and I'm just checking and checking, making sure things are working, looking to see if it is this drip in the right at the hose bib, the same as the one all the way at the end, because these things can just get clogged and they can kind of create those inconsistencies. Great. Um, we have a person that asked a clarification question. Does the flow rate for drip tubing describe how much water the tube can carry? Or does, does it describe how much is discharged through the emitters? Mm, the, the flow rate. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure specifically what. So the, the gallons per hour flow rate is going to be how much water is specifically coming out of each emitter. The, um, the run length is going to be how much can go through that system and still run consistently. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So, and this is where if, if people are using drip, and I don't want to confuse people, drip tape, which is that stuff that you often see at farms that gets thrown away, is going to have um, very different calculations for knowing how much water is coming out of it than these thicker plastics, which where that number is like each, every six inches, each one of those is dripping at 0.52 gallons per hour. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, somebody here is having leaky goof plugs. Um, and that person is wondering how many goof plugs can you plug into a line before you have to throw the line away? And this is a great question. Um, I have a lot of leaky goof plugs too. The thing I have learned with the, so it's, it's really, you always want to be like, oh, I made this hole and I can use it over and over again. I can use it when I want to use it, not use it when I don't want to do it. Once you take the, say you had an emitter in the hole, that plant, something happened to that plant. You, it, oh, maybe it's a native that got big and it no longer needs water anymore, right? You just had water on it because it was young. And so you plug that and then something happens to it and you're like, oh, maybe it does need water and get you pull it out. Um, and then you try to plug it again. And so every time we pull these things in and out, it's just gonna start leaking there. My new rule of thumb is, is using a little more plastic, but I plug it once. I, 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 um, I have a drip emitter in it and I have to take it out. I plug it once and I just make a new hole if I ever need to use it again. And if it's really drippy, essentially just cut it out and put a coupler on it. And that's going to be the best bet. But they're not really, the holes just aren't really reusable over and over again. Okay. Is there any way to set up a system where you have mixed plants with different root depths and or water needs on the same line? Is there a trick for that? You know, I really, I, I kind of have that similar situation at my house. And what I've, I've been trying to do is um, push things more similarly. So I have, a, I have a lot of annuals that I'm growing under um, perennial brassicas. And I was really playing with that, trying to be like, okay, how can I water both? And have been exploring that for a year and really have finally come to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm going to add water separately to my annuals and my perennials. Um, and it kind of goes with that idea that a lot of the perennials are going to need these less frequent but deeper waterings. And the annuals um, are going to probably most likely have a higher 
water demand, but you can find that middle ground if you really need to, right? Just kind of looking at that um, perennials might be able to deal with a little bit of extra water or getting a, like doing like a mainline system where maybe you're putting more drip emitters where you have your annuals and less where the perennials are. So kind of you can control that by popping those emitters in where you want them. Could be another method. Okay. Speaking of emitters, um, do you have any preferences um, with built-in emitters versus attached emitters? Yeah, I think there's no preference. Um, I, <clears throat> I think it just depends on um, what, what your goals are, um, like how many plants you have in in the different in the different zones um the reason attached or like putting your own on are nice is because they tend to have higher flow rates so if you are trying to do something that you have less plants in a pretty sandy soil and they're like kind of far apart that's a really great method for that but if you have things in rows i um, uh, late and like just install installing things wise it's just easier to go with something that already has emitters in it um and yeah yeah okay i think we have some farmers on the call so we have one farmer who's got one to 200 foot rows and is looking for a formula or a reference to help understand how to maximize efficiency with water delivery and we have somebody using um, a tech line or a netfim, netofim product who feels like the result is too dry. What, what do you know about those? Um, as far as the math goes, look at my worksheet, um, which is a very watered down uh, version of all the crazy math because you can do a lot of there's a lot of resources on how to get really mathy and really technical with irrigation. And I wanted to just like leave all that for this workshop. Um, but the, the worksheet is going to go out as well as the CASFIS resources um, have very specific formulas for small farms and um, how to really create water budgeting and how to do row crops and the is going to be um, really best to explore with the kind of calculator and like getting to know your specific type and what kind of output you have and that sort of thing. Um, and then I, I guess I would need to know for the Netafin, um, I these these uh, risers that I use for our trees are Netafin, and I personally really like them because we have a lot of sediment. Um, like you saw, I have about three to four filters on each section and they um, have better adjustments for a lot of sedimentation. But if you're finding that it's it's not, if it's a, if it's say like a drip and it's just not feeling like it's getting um, wet enough, knowing what kind of soil you, you have, I often have that problem because our soils are so sandy. So I've had to really adjust our systems to run more often um, and then also checking for um, watching that it's running, um, maybe flush the line. You can take the end caps off a line and just let that water flow through and that will help get any sedimentation out. Um, making sure that the lines aren't too long. Um, with if, if it's like a half inch, they can usually be about 300 feet long before they start losing their, their like consistency. Um, but then it might have been weird to see in that one photo. So I have a lot of these half inch drip on a, a berm. So it's like four feet tall. And then uh, when I first installed them, I was trying to make these loops and I would make this loop where I would start the bottom and go up to the top and then come back down to the bottom. And the, the water couldn't push back up to the top. And so really seeing if you're on a, on a slope 
that you're, you're using gravity um, to work with you, not against you. And then the last thing I'll say I, um, is that circles are also a really great way to help with uniformity. So putting something in a circle is gonna keep um, that pressure pushing through versus like if you have a straight line and it's kind of hitting an end and if it's clogged out there, then it's gonna maybe have trouble. Yeah. Okay, that was great. Um, I'm gonna ask one last question. Um, and that is if there's a couple people who've said they're interested in hiring someone to do the math, to do the technical evaluation and, and the water calculations and um, help evaluate the soil. How would you go about hiring that kind of person? What would you look for? Even better, I probably, um, I think the best bet is there are um, app-based or in like smart timers. And so look more into um, timers that can do all this math for you. I use a system called Ratio, which is was actually designed for like golf courses, right? And all of their water, um, their lawns, things I don't have. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and it, it's a smart system that you can create zones on, it co connects to your local weather station, you tell it about your soil type, and it will kind of, do these smart predictions and adjustments. And then I have to go through and kind of tell it like, hey, um, you're used to lawns. I just transplanted this plant. It's got four inch roots and I, and I can adjust those. So um, that is probably a much more economical method. Um, there's other systems that I haven't used from other companies. Um, and they're, they're never perfect and they never mean you need to totally stop checking your soil moisture because they, they're good predictors and they will keep things alive, but they might not be precise. So I would go that route first. Um, and then also not hiring somebody specifically, but looking at resources from your local um, cooperative extension are gonna be really good. And then also in my worksheet, I connected to, to um, this idea of an ETO, which is a reference ET. And so we have these for different zones in California. I know, it, I know Texas has one too, and probably all the other states that have agriculture in them. And you can use this to really see what water you're averagely or you're typically losing in in your zone and once you kind of do that math and understand how much water is being put back down through your drip system it's going to be a lot easier to make a schedule so um i kind of threw all the math into that worksheet and once you look through it you're going to be like oh, okay it's maybe it's not as intimidating as i thought um maybe i can do this like just hop on that um, the the CMS website and compare that to what your thing is outputting and find those those little connections will start clicking and then if you keep having questions after that you know you can um, do the apps and try to reach out to different um, I know there's a in Santa Cruz I know we have a lot of different landscaping um, companies and people to reach out to. And we have your phone number now. Email. Yeah, and you have my phone number. Um, but I don't, I don't ever just tell anybody how much to water unless I know about their soil type. <laughs> okay, well that, that worksheet especially sounds like an incredible resource as well as all this material you're put together. Thank you so much for that. And, and I have big dreams that maybe I'll make a little YouTube channel for everybody. Um, keep adding stuff to it. So <laughs> keep That's looking out. Fantastic. We, we should all follow you for that. Um, we are always trying to improve and, and find out how we did. So um, in the chat, um, I've just put a link to the evaluation survey. And we're going to um, also send that out with the resources. Hope that you can all give us five minutes of your time and tell us um, how we did and what you would like to see in the future. And last slide, please. 
Um, CASFIS relies on grants for over half of its operating income. It is not supported fully by the university in the way that other parts of UCSD are. This workshop was offered last year or would have been offered last year for a fee. We're doing these ones online for free during COVID. So it's been a difficult time for all of us, but if you're in a position to support this work, please join the friends and or make a donation to CASFIS if you can at that URL, which I will now put in the chat. So with that, I wanna thank Avery for all the wonderful work they have done and uh, wish you all a wonderful week. Yeah, definitely um, reach out if you have any questions and, be, and also check out these resources, which are awesome. Okay, that was great. With that, we're gonna end this session and thank you so much. We hope to see you soon.